وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار الحمد لله we praise Allah and we seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from our bad deeds whoever Allah guides there is none that can lead him astray and whoever is led astray then there is no guide for him i bear witness that no god has the right to be worshiped other than Allah he is alone and has no partners and i bear witness that Muhammad is the slave and his messenger o you who believe fear Allah as you ought to be feared and don't die except as muslims O humanity, fear your Lord, who has created you from a single soul, and created from its mate, and scattered from them too many men and women. And fear Allah, for whom you deny your mutual rights, and don't cut off relations with the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is a raqib, a watcher, a guardian over you. O you who believe, fear Allah, and say that which is correct, in order that he may accept from you your deeds, and forgive you of your sins, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, has achieved the greatest achievement and ma ba'du certainly the most truthful speech is the book of Allah and the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the most evil of affairs are newly invented matters in this deen and every newly invented matter in this deen is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is a strain <coughs> and every strain is in the hellfire continuing uh, with the chapter or the book of the affairs that have been made forbidden from the book Riyadh al-Salihin Gardens of the Righteous by Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah this week we are with the evidences that support the six exceptions that Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah makes for ghiba the six cases where it is permissible to make the ghiba or there's no harm in making the ghiba this week <clears throat> uh before we get into our explanation i just wanted to note to you uh that uh which is taking place with myself concerning the explanation of riyadh salihin and that is alhamdulillah this past week i finally got my hands on the explanation bahjatu nadirin sharh riyadh salihin by salim al hilali and this explanation is the first explanation of riyadh salihin with the explanation uh or yeah with the explanation in accordance with the methodology of the salaf al salih or the methodology of our righteous predecessors uh the other explanations the other explanations uh that we had to use and explanate and explaining this riyadh salihin were written by scholars rahimahumullah uh who were not a part of the aqidah of the salaf nor the methodology of the salaf and for that it used to be difficult on myself to uh, translate uh to excuse me to explain riyadh salihin as i had to be in the library for times going through the books to make sure that what is given is correct and this is uh, how in general i approach as i learned from the ulama that we benefit from the scholars and no perfection is only for allah and when we know particular scholars have particular problems maybe in their belief or that they don't uh consider the authenticity of hadith or something that we take into consideration we benefit from those scholars and then we just double check on those areas that they're known to be mistaken in or those areas where they're a little weak in 
that we double check from the other scholars who are stronger in those areas or who put concern in those areas. So this week, alhamdulillah, it was refreshing for myself to be able to have all of the research put into one book and that you don't have to do too much uh, double checking. Though, <coughs> being a student of knowledge, uh, I'm forced to check and to double check what I learned from the ulama so that I can see it for myself. If he says the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, sometimes I like to go back to Sahih al-Bukhari to see is it exactly with that wording. And the same thing with Sahih Muslim and some of the other books of hadith. And when the shaykh he's explaining, as he mentions in his introduction, that he uses the books that I used to use to help me explain, like the books of tafsir, Imam al-Tabari and Ibn Kathir, Imam al-Shawkani and the other ulama who have good uh, explanations or tafsir of the Qur'an, that he uses them, and sometimes even on the Shaykh Salim al-Hilali, Hafadhullah, that I still check back every now and then, but it's not to the degree that it was on the other ulama that you know they were lightly, they were uh, taking it lightly on particular issues and not really going into depth or not trying to bring that correct methodology that we try to adhere to and that is our understanding and practical application of the Qur'an and the Sunnah according to the methodology of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then their companions and then their companions in specific and then whoever followed them after that. We come to the first hadith and that is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha where she said, Anna rajulan istaadhana ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqala i'adhanu lahu bi'sa akhu al-ashira and Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah he says that this is collected by al-Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, this hadith, it's a long hadith and Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah he brings the part that uh, is applicable to this chapter that we're in being permissible to make in certain circumstances. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that a man sought the permission of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to enter into the house and the Prophet gave him permission and said, uh, Oh, what an evil brother this is. Here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he didn't say this while the man was present. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed him to come in, spoke kindly to him, and was nice with him, and when he left he said, oh what an evil person this is. Here, uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, is speaking against someone not in their presence. And this is a ghiba, or what we know to be ghiba. And here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is showing uh, when ghiba is permissible, as the ulama explained. Uh, in this hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't speak about the details of that man. But he just said that he was an evil man, speaking about him in general. And this was from the good character of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, that he didn't necessarily give the details of the evil or corruption of a person, but that he would be sufficient and say that's an evil person, so as to warn the people from him. And we see from the rest of the hadith uh, that uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you said what you said about that man, and then you spoke all nicely to him. She said, Aisha, indeed, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Aisha, indeed the worst of the people is the people are the people that the rest of the people leave them alone out of fear of their evilness and their corruption. Or in another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Have you known me, Aisha, to be 
a fahishan or to be a person who speaks badly in general indeed the worst of the people in the sight of Allah or in the sight of Allah on the day of resurrection are the people that are left alone because the rest of the people fear their evil here the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we see uh, from his speech is showing that I told you he was a bad person in order to stay away from him and even myself though I spoke nice to him because I didn't want to be involved in his corruption and we know how we do that if a person is you like here he comes again that and you might say something you're trying to warn the people of this corruption when he comes you don't say anything salamu alaikum akhi yeah I'm okay alhamdulillah 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 in order to try to just wait for him to come and go so you can be safe from his corruption here <coughs> the ulama of Islam as Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah he puts this hadith under the chapter title that uh, the permissibility of speaking about your brother behind his back if he's among the people of corruption or among the people Ahlul Rib or the Riyab or the people of suspicion and accusation that you think that their deen and stuff something just not right about them these people Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah is showing that it's permissible to speak against them behind their backs but of course it's for the purpose of warning the people not to be involved with that person so as to be affected by his corruption and this is the time as we see from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it is permissible to speak behind about a brother behind his back in a manner that he doesn't like as in general and this is the basic rule that the Prophet Sallallahu has established for us it is haram for us to talk about our brothers behind their backs in a manner that they don't like except in these cases that we're dealing with now like this case when the person is a person of corruption and bad character and manners and so on that you could speak about him behind his back in order to warn the people to leave him alone and not to engage in arguing with him or debating him or allowing him to uh, affect you with his corruption but just to say listen here he comes He's the one he tries to borrow your money and he won't pay you back. Then when he comes, oh, how you doing? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do you have any money? Oh, akhi, man, subhanallah, I had a lot of bills this week. And, and, and then everyone will play the same line as they were warned. When he comes, he's going to try to borrow your money. And if he gets it, he's not going to pay it back. So everyone will be just trying to make excuses in order to uh, get rid of him. Oh, he, you know, uh, I just gave all my money to my wife, or I just went shopping yesterday, or I got to go shopping this evening, and I'm not sure how much I'm going to have left, so, you know, just put me on hold. You know, anything that we would use as an excuse in order to get rid of a person. In this case, uh, the ulama, as Imam al-Nawwi, rahimahullah, is saying that it is permissible to speak about him behind his back in order to warn the people of his corruption. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the explanation that the ulama bring up this hadith and this is showing that which Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah has established for us that it is permissible to speak about a brother behind his back if he is among the people of corruption in order to warn the people of corruption and then even in that case we should watch our tongues and not to be too detailed about the person but in general about the person in order to warn them from the evil and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best the, uh, the shaykh he adds that this type of speaking about him it is really advice for the brothers that are listening and it's warning them and it's giving them good exhortation uh, in order to protect them in their deen and as far as the people who say that this was only for the Prophet وسلم, and not for the rest of the Ummah they say there's no evidence to show that the Prophet والسلام, was the only one permissible to talk about the people behind their back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best
The next hadith is also on the authority of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ma azunnu fulanan wa fulanan ya'rifani min deenina shay'an. And this is collected by Imam al-Bukhari. And in the other narration, uh, he adds, Ma azunnu fulanan wa fulanan ya'rifani min deenina alladhi nahnu alayhi. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I don't think that so and so and so and so, I don't think that both of them know anything about this deen of ours. And in another narration, and this is also in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is the next hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I don't think that so and so and so and so, I don't think that both of them know anything about the deen that we are upon. Uh, here, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was speaking about two people behind their backs uh, as we see in this hadith and Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad Rahimahullah one of the narrators of this hadith he said that those two people they were two munafiqs and we'll deal with that inshallah ta'ala here we see that it is permissible or some suspicion about people is permissible. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, I don't think that so and so know anything about this deen of ours. And that is uh, to be said, of course, uh, where you are warning the people about being like those two people. Where you're warning the people about being like those two people. Uh, Salim al-Hilali rahimahullah, also shows the permissibility of exposing the characteristics of nifaq. Exposing the characteristics of the nifaq. And he says <coughs> that the suspicion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us from, this is the bad suspicion about a Muslim whose deen and character and honor is intact. Not about the person whose deen is out of what, not intact, his character is bad, he doesn't respect himself, has no honor amongst the believers, that this is not when a person, this is not the suspicion that Allah has made prohibited if the person is already bad. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hujurat, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu jitanibu kathiran min al-dhan, inna ba'd al-dhan ni ithm. Oh, you will believe, stay far away from suspicion. Indeed, some suspicion is sin. That suspicion is to be about a person who is known for his deen and his character to talk bad about him. But if the person, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is speaking about these two people, if the person isn't known for his deen or his character and you said, yeah, you know so-and-so, he don't know nothing about this deen. I saw him come into the masjid and just sit down. And this happens, unfortunately, and it's to warn the people. As I uh, told the brothers one time, uh, I went to a masjid, and the imam of the masjid entered into the masjid and just sat down. Entered into the masjid and just sat down. Uh, before he entered into the masjid and sat down, I think I mentioned before, he was outside smoking a cigarette first. Then he came into the masjid and just sat down and didn't make turakas. So I told the brothers, you know, you have to be aware of what this imam says, because this is his condition. Of course, that imam wouldn't like me to mention this about him behind his back. But if his deed and his character was above that, then it would be per in, uh, not permissible for us to hold suspicion about that person. Only when his deed and his character is evident to the people that there's some type of corruption or farthness away from obedience to Allah, then that suspicion comes in in order to warn the people and not to go farther than that. Not to just let our tongues just constantly, always, continually talk about the people for the sake of just talking about them. And then to use the excuse, well, he liked that anyway. No, this is for the instance as the ulama are showing us. In order to warn the people from that person. In order to warn the people, maybe he's an excellent speaker and he's deviant or he's astray and you warn the people of him in order to save them from his tongue. Like uh, Louis the Lion. He has a nice presentation. 
and the people may be fooled and some Muslims are fooled by his presentation. So then you might bring out uh, the lying characteristics about him and how he's a kafir and he's not on the deen of Islam and the proof and the reasons why in order to warn the people about him. Not just to be speaking about someone for the sake of speaking about him, but for the sake of warning the people and saving the people and advising the people to keep the people on the right path and to keep them away from that which is bad. The next hadith is the hadith of Fatima bint Qaysin radiallahu anha قالت أتيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقلت إن أبا الجهم ومعاوية خطبان فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما معاوية فصعلوك لا مال له وأما أبو الجهم فلا يضع العصا عن عاتقه إن إمام النووي says متفق عليه or collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, in another narration, the Prophet Wasallam adds from the narration of Imam Muslim, وَأَمَّا أَبُوا الْجَهْمِ فَضَرَّابُ النِّسَاءِ وَهُوَ التَّفْسِيرٌ لِرِوَايَةِ لَا يَضَعُ الْعَصَى عَنْ عَاتِقِهِ وَقِيلَ مَعْنَاهُ كَثِيرُ الْأَسْفَارِ Fatima bint Qaysan رضي الله عنها she said, I went to the Prophet wasallam and I said to him, Indeed, Aba al-Jahmi, and this is a companion, this is not Abu al-Jahl, this is Abi, Abu Jahmi, and Muawiyah, they both have proposed to me. The Prophet wasallam says, as, for, as, as concerning Muawiyah, he's stingy and greedy and he doesn't have any wealth. Or he's stingy, excuse me, he's uh, poor and he doesn't have any wealth. And as far as uh, Abu Jahm, then he uh, beats women. Or as the phrase go, he doesn't uh, take his stick off of his shoulders. Uh, and this expression, as the ulama mentioned, as we see from the narration of Sahih Muslim, that it might mean, it says in the other narration, that he constantly beats his women, his wives. And the ulama, they say that what is meant by this expression, فَلَا يَضْعُ الْعَصَى عَنْ عَتِقِهِ That he constantly beats his women. And some of the ulama, they say that it means that he travels a lot. Either it means he beats his women all the time, or he travels a lot one or the other. In this hadith, we see that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about those two men uh, behind their backs, of course in a manner that they wouldn't like. And here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is showing when it is permissible for us to do that, and that is when it is nasiha or advice for the people uh, as we see in this case of marriage where you need to know about a person and you need to know his character and his deen because you might want to marry a sister to that person then it's permissible to spill the beans or to let it be known about that person and if it wasn't for that you would hide your brother's faults if it wasn't that this issue was serious and a judgment had to be made that you would hide your brother's fault but because this judgment has to be made that you have to come out and to tell the truth about your brother only for this instance. As the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is mentioning. In the case of marriage, the advice is only if you ask. Yes. Uh, the brother is asking, in this case of marriage, it's only if you ask. Only if you ask. Here the Prophet sallam was asked, and he answered. I don't know if you're saying, if we find out somebody wants to go get married, to hurry up and go say, ah, oh, I know so and so and so and so. If it was for the benefit, if it really was for the benefit that somebody uh, may not have known something about a brother and you know, and then it's time to get married, and that person didn't know that you had a relationship with them and they didn't ask you, and you knew and you had the opportunity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but maybe this would be the time to add your piece of advice only for that. 
in order to help the person make a judgment, but not to make a big issue about it so the person can say, oh, you're talking behind my back, or why you do that, you're supposed to hide your brother's faults, but to present it in the way, Akhi, if it wasn't for this issue of marriage. And if it wasn't that I thought that this would help you to make your decision better, and this deen was not nasiha, I would not come to you with what I'm coming to you with. And I'm not coming to you with it for you to discuss it with the other people. I'm coming to you with it in order to help you make a decision. And it's between me, you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we came like that, inshallah, we hope that there wouldn't be any harm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I didn't really do the whole thing, but just, I think I got a little. I'm saying before the person got married, it was something. If, if someone's getting married. And I say, Akhi, I want to marry that sister. And I heard that you know her. Tell me about her. Maybe you knew some things that weren't good about her. It would be permissible in this case to mention those things. If it's not this case, you can't just tell me about her. Akhi, you know her? Yeah, I know her. Subhanallah. No, it's not permissible in that, <laughs> in that case to tell about that sister. We should hide one another's faults. But only if the case of marriage where a person is going to make a decision. Uh, there were some other points about this hadith, and it's a long hadith. As uh, I went back to Sahih Muslim, as I said, sometimes I go back to check the hadith out. Uh, this was a longer hadith, uh, and there's some benefits in it. And uh, for that, I want to mention these points, but I think I'll mention them as we go along for the benefits of this hadith. Uh, we see also from the benefits of this hadith where it is permissible to listen to a lady that you're not mahram for her or she's not from her fam- from your family if she's coming to you uh, to ask a question about the deen or for some advice or to help you make a judgment then it's permissible to listen to a lady that's not your mahram that you're not mahram for or a lady that's not permissible for you. Here we see that it is permissible for a person to make, uh, to propose over top of his brother if uh, there's no answer. If you propose and they don't even consider you, then the next person can come and propose. If, uh, we know the Prophet ﷺ uh, said, لا يخطو على Uh, inshallah, the Prophet or as Qamal Qawr will bring the English meaning anyway uh, from this authentic hadith there is no proposing over top of the proposal of your brother this is if you propose to uh, the wali for such and such of a sister uh, I want to ask about that sister the brother tells him, okay, let's check him out. The okay, let's check him out, nobody can come after him to propose until that checking out is decided and they're going to decide okay or no. If he just says, Akhi, what about sister so-and-so? Until the sister and the brother, the wali, considers him. They, don't have, they might not get married, but until they actually consider his proposal, it's sufficient for someone else, it's permissible for someone else to say, you know, I was, you know, want to ask about so and so and sister. But once something has been established that they're going to check this out or that, then no one can come behind the proposal of his brother. As the Prophet wasallam has made that not permissible or haram. Uh, the Shaykh said, uh, showing some of the benefits of this hadith, uh, the encouragement to guide the people to that which is good, even if they don't like it. To guide the people to that which is good, even if they don't like it. After the Prophet Wasallam said that Muawiyah is poor, he doesn't have any money, and Abu Jahmi that he beats the women or that he travels too much depending on what meaning that that has. The Prophet ﷺ said, marry Usama ibn Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu hub, hubbi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The beloved 
son of the beloved uh, friend of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Usama ibn Uzay. The Prophet said, "Marry Usama ibn Uzay." She said, "I don't like him." The Prophet sallallahu said, "Marry him," and she married him anyway. And uh, Imam al Nawawi rahimahullah, and she said after that, and Allah had made a lot of good in my marriage of him. And this is why the Shaykh is adding some of the benefit that you don't necessarily see in the Hadith, Alhamdulillah, because he's looking at the Hadith in relationship to the whole Hadith and not just what's mentioned in our chapter. And we can get this benefit as uh, we were doing in some of our other classes showing that there's a lot of benefit in the Hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. So here it shows to guide a person to something that is better for them, even if they don't like it. And this is advice to some of the women uh, in particular, that they should listen to the walis when they advise them to marry. You should marry brother so-and-so. Him? I don't like him. He's not handsome enough. He's not tall enough. He's not this. He's not that. But the wali is advising you because he knows that that brother has what is good for you. And uh, it's good for us, as we are saying that the Prophet Sallallahu is good for us to advise someone to do something even if they don't want to do that. It's good to advise someone to do something that's going to be good for them even if they don't like that. Uh, uh, some of our advice came about a group of some deviant Muslims, which is good for them even if they don't see it. And here we see on this issue of marriage, and this is where the sisters should be advised more so, as many times the sisters, if the wali tells them don't marry a particular brother, they just go get another wali, so that they can follow their own desires instead of following the advice of someone who's looking out for their best interests. And even the brothers encourage the sister to do that. Oh, he don't want you to marry me, and they don't like me, astaghfirullah. Or that brother doesn't like me. He got something against me. Get another wali so we can get married. Because you know we write for one another. She says, okay. Anyway, the sisters should be a little more patient with the brothers who are in charge of them and to take some of their advice, even if they don't like it, because sometimes, as we see in this example, that it could be better for them. Uh, the shaykh, he mentions, among, among the benefits from this hadith, is to accept the advice from the people who have virtues and to submit to that which they are guiding you to because the end of it will be good. If you know the person to have a good deen and a good character and he comes with you for some advice, even if you don't like it, you should accept it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make a good end in that advice from that person of virtue and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, here the shaykh, he uh, is extending some of the benefits of the hadith by saying that it is recommended to marry a man who can take care of his family financially, who will really take care of his family financially, as the Prophet ﷺ had advised the sister not to marry him because he don't have any money. Uh, and the Shaykh is using the opposite to show that if a man is well off, then you should marry him. Of course, you're looking at the deen and the character first. And then outside of the deen and the character, then you're looking, if he has some wealth on top of his deen and character, then marry that one with the deen and the character and wealth is better for you than the one with the deen and the character and poverty. As we see from this advice of the Prophet It's also some advice uh, to uh, discourage the women from marrying uh, the brothers who have deen and character and don't have a lot of wealth or don't have any money, uh, we should put it like that. Not just poor, but, you know, like he's, I don't know, dirt poor or something. <laughs> and also to discourage the women from marrying the men who beat their women all the time. Who beat their women all the time. Or as the other meaning, who travel a lot. To discourage it because it might be too difficult on the lady to be beat all the time in order to keep her in check or her husband is always away from home and never home with her. Uh, uh, we also see 
are some of the benefits from this hadith are that if someone comes to you for advice or to make a choice between two things, then you might add a third thing in there that you might think is better for them. And this is permissible. person says, uh, should I take a job here or there? And you say, I think it's better for you to take a job over there. You know, to add another choice other than the choices that they have and that this is okay and permissible as we see from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. The Shaykh says, this hadith does not show that it's not, it doesn't show that it's haram to beat your wives. But it is permissible, of course, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it permissible for the men uh, if their wives are out of place and they advise them first and they left their beds that they can beat their women with a beating that doesn't leave any bruises or any marks or light beating. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that permissible and this hadith isn't saying that. That what we benefit from this hadith is that a man that's always going to do it. Every time his wife gets out of place, he's going to beat her with a light beating. Every time she gets out of place. And this is what is discouraged and not that it's not permissible in Islam. Uh, also, and this is the last point of the hadith before the event, that the Sheikh is saying that uh, Usama, uh, his father, as we know, Zayd ibn Haritha, he was from the uh, Mawali of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or I don't know what you call that. Uh, huh? No, it's another meaning. Uh, it's something like a slave. It's something like a slave. Huh? No. Let's just leave it. It's like a slave. Of course, we know that Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu anhu, he got caught in the battle. And Khadija, radiallahu anha, she bought him. And she owned him. And she gave him as a gift to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahibi wa sallam. And the Prophet owned him. And then they became so close that the people called him Zayd ibn Muhammad, Zayd the son of Muhammad. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them that this is improper, that's not his son, but to call him Zayd ibn Haritha, to call them by their father's names. Uh, his son is Usama. So they're looking at the lineage of the person and they're saying, well, the Prophet owned him and then that's his son. And then this lady, uh, Fatima bin Qais, she's a Qurashiya lady from the Quraysh tribe from the big tribe, the noble tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam here we see that a man of a low status uh, could marry a lady of a high status and that even though there's some incompatibility with the level or the status of a, of a person or uh, the husband and the wife it is permissible to marry someone uh, like this though what is normal and what is uh, proper is to marry someone that is on the same level with you and like that so that you would be more compatible and it would be better for you all to be as husband and wife and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best this is what we have time for today and if there was anything good then it's from Allah and if there was anything bad then it's from me wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa subhanaka allahumu wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tuvi